So we're just about to get started. Uh, so uh, before we actually get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Everyone attending this is automatically muted. So if you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A feature that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to ask questions as we go. If there's time for a Q&A session at the end, we'll answer uh, some of your questions live. And we'll also send a recording of the session to everyone that is registered via email. And that message will also have a survey. So we'd love to hear your feedback. So we're gonna jump right in. Welcome to our GIA knowledge sessions. Uh, these are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are fueled by our decades of research. And our mission is to share our discoveries and learnings with the world. And that's exactly what we're here to do today. And we have something a little different today. We have our first GI knowledge session with a guest moderator, and we're, we're going to be talking all about sustainability in our industry. So we've invited Melanie Grant to be our moderator today. Uh, she's gonna lead the conversation about sustainability with our expert panel. She is the luxury editor of 1843 Magazine at The Economist and author of Coveted Art and Innovation in High Jewelry, which just dropped yesterday, so it's available now. And we have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to turn it over to Melanie. Thank you, Kelly. That's lovely. And uh, I have to say, it's lovely to be here. I'm a great admirer of the GIA and what you do. And um, I'm going to kind of dive straight in because we've got a lot to, to address here. So first, let me just introduce the panel because they are very exciting. Um, I'm going to start with Susan Jack, um, who was appointed president and CEO of the GIA in 2014, having spent more than 30 years in retail at Borsheim's in Omaha, Nebraska reporting for 20 years as CEO to Warren Buffett. She served as a governor of the GIA board since 96, is a trained gemologist with both her GG and FGA and has a lifelong jewelry obsession. So that's Susan. Next is Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez. Um, she's curatrix of the Mineralogical and Geological Museum, Harvard University, overseeing its earth science collections. She holds a PhD in earth sciences and specializes in the area of gem deposits, as well as being a member of the Women's Jewelry Association. So thanks for joining us, Raquel. Uh, next after that is Livia Firth MBE. Livia is a co-founder and creative director of EcoAge, an agency and consultancy dedicated to sustainability. Also Green Carpet Challenge, an initiative aimed at improving sustainability in the fashion industry. She is a UN leader for change, also giving keynote addresses to places such as the World Economic Forum. And finally, last but not least, is Alexandra Moore. Alexandra creates one-of-a-kind high jewellery, incorporating ethical materials such as the taguia seed, taguia seed in place of ivory. She's launched her first collection in 2010 at Philips de Puri and then moved to Bali to work with local artisans. Now back in New York, she campaigns for transparency and collaboration in the industry and is on a mission to make sustainability an integral part of our lives rather than simply a trend. So as you can see our panel is highly qualified to examine the minefield that is sustainability and I called it that because when I speak to people on a daily basis there's a lot of confusion about how to contribute and invest in this area and in this sustainability as a movement within the jewellery industry. And it's kind of a pleasure today to bring some experts together so we can really get into the discussion of like why it's important. So I'm going to start with Susan. Um, hello, Susan. Hello. Welcome, um, everybody. Great to see you all. Thank you. Um, and Susan, so one could argue that the collector is the most important element of, of what we all do when it comes to ethical jewellery, because without them, we would have no industry. Is there a desire for sustainable jewellery and how strong is that currently? And how do you think we can increase that desire? I think we require the collector as well as the consumer. Uh, if consumers decide they don't want to buy jewellery anymore, there's no industry. Um, we don't see that happening. We're very optimistic, um, obviously, for the future. But we do believe there is obviously a very strong uh, desire for sustainable um, ethical jewelry and we're seeing that more and more and I think consumers have become more attuned to wanting to understand where any of the products that they own come from. Um, so not only in jewelry but the cup of coffee they're drinking or the clothing that perhaps 
they are um, wearing. And so making sure that they understand that their jewelry is responsibly sourced, that their purchases empower and benefit the communities and the people who produce the gems and the metals that go into their cherished beautiful pieces is really important. And I think the interest is really good for the industry. There's so many great stories to be told. And I think that it gives us an opportunity to address those um, misperceptions. There are misperceptions about the gem and jewelry industry and we can set that story straight. I think that we can increase the interest in ethical and sustainable jewelry by helping consumers understand the great work that is done um, by the entire supply chain. And I think it's really important that from the mines to the retail counter, that story is being shared. So we all work uh, to bring the benefits of the industry to all the people and communities who bring these wonderful pieces to market. And I think we've got to be very prepared to to actively engage and storytell. So tell those positive stories. I think Botswana is a remarkable example of that. And Livia did an amazing documentary on that, which I hope many of the attendees will, will look at and, and learn from. Um, and GI has been actively involved. So um, a few years ago, we developed and distributed a pictorial guide for artisanal miners to help them better understand the, and benefit the rough that they were finding. Um, and rough buyers are willing to pay more, we know that, for higher quality stones. So the miners that receive this guide and also the training from GIA have seen a much greater return on their efforts. In fact, we partner with PACT, uh, P-A-C-T, the development NGO out of Washington, uh, D.C., and they calculated a 12-fold social return on GI's investment in the program. Communities, one of the miners actually stated they could now, now build brick houses. Um, there were more children in schools. Uh, there were other benefits. And last year, GI announced we've committed $1.3 million and a five-year commitment to expanding this project, which is to date only been in East Africa. So we're really excited to be a part of this journey with everybody and really bringing awareness through our education, um, both from the mining level all the way through to the retail level. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Um, and I think, you know, we, we talk about retail, which is obviously a key um, element of the whole process, the whole chain. What challenges do you think that retail face? Is it price? Is it just the interest in, in ethical jewelry? Is it marketing? What, what do you think the biggest challenges are for retail? I think all of those are challenges. I think part of it is, again, retailers are the front line, the last 18 inches of the supply chain. Um, they're the ones interacting with the consumer. And it's really important that they listen to the consumer. And I think that listening um, to their concerns, to their desires, helps us to educate. And so having trained sales associates, having under, sales associates that understand this, that are educating themselves, that are reading up on it so that they are the expert when the consumer comes in, I think is really, really important. So addressing these concerns as they're raised and having the right answers. And again, going back to that incredible storytelling, whether it be on websites is where a lot of this sustainable information can be put out by retail jewelers. Um, but having people really understand the true value of sustainability and what it brings, how it empowers communities um, to have more successful lives. And I think that's really critically important. Thanks, Susan. So in terms of stones, because I get a lot of requests about stones when it comes to sort of um, people's interest, um, consumers really care, I think, about where their diamonds come from. How does that affect grading, would you say? So it doesn't actually affect the grading. So GI is the inventor of the four C's and we evaluate the color and the clarity based on the scales and standards that GIA developed back in the 1950s and it, which has become the global standard for evaluation. But what we have found is that there is no scientific way, there's no DNA in a diamond that we can take that tells us where it comes from. And that's challenging. And it has been challenging because the supply chain um, in past years has been somewhat opaque. I think there's much, much greater transparency today. And what GI hoped to do when we brought uh, to market the new origin report that we brought to market a few years ago is to scientifically match the polished diamond to its original rough that has been pre-examined 
by GIA. So we do have to see the rough before it's polished. And then scientifically, we can match that. I think this gives consumers incredible confidence on the origin documentation provided. Um, and so I think we've really seen great uptick in this. I think it fits perfectly with our mission again, of educating and protecting the, the public. That's what we do. And so consumers purchasing one of Mother Nature's greatest treasures, a natural diamond that was formed more than a billion years ago, they can now learn more about that diamond journey and the positive impact it had on the communities in which it was mined. Um, so the, the important factor, I think, is there are diamonds mined in many different places. It's helping again to educate and storytell so that consumers understand that product journey in a way that they've never been able to before. Thank you, Susan. And I'm gonna move on to Alexandra. Hello, Alexandra. Um, so from the consumer to the creator, you are um, a jewelry artist. Um, many designers at the top level have yet to engage, many designers at the top level have yet to engage in sustainable practices when it comes to high jewellery. What can we do to encourage high level designers to get involved and what first inspired you to work with the Tagua Seed? Well, Melanie, we're, we're talking about a serious matter here, right? Um, what we do today, what we do now will affect the future of our planet and, and the future generations. Um, I'm very passionate, as you know, about engaging with sustainable practices and affecting mindful change in uh, our industry and for the betterment of our planet as big and um, encompassing as it sounds. But I, I also believe uh, that the world needs us uh, to follow our passion. And this is really where the key lies. Um, it takes guts to follow, to follow our heart and, um, and turn that passion into a career. And it is the past that, uh, that has been rewarding for me, fulfilling and rewarding, uh, but has not been without its own challenges. Um, perhaps it may sound um, shocking to some of you, but I don't believe in creating a business strategy for the sake of sales. Um, crafting the right message and standing firmly behind our mission or a business mission is really paramount to the success of any sustainable um, or sustainably focused business or campaign. So while the attention on revenues is really important, and of course, everybody um, wants to get to the bottom line of sales, the business that attempts to just capitalize on the use of a trendy term like sustainability without truly buying into what it means or to the mission uh, will eventually fail in their effort. And, and I've seen numerous times and I have some, some examples from, from what I've seen in our industry. Um, but the business that embraces mindfulness and, and is honest um, and is able to create a successful model, I believe this one can benefit from uh, a much more meaningful and successful experience and being able to generate sales. Melanie, in your book, um, your new book, coveted, uh, the art of innovation in high jewelry, um, you really created a beautiful story of our industry and it is, it's showing a great reflection on, um, on jewelry industry as a whole and, and on, our, on, our, on the way we do business. Um, you created a, a, a story um, and challenged the relations, relationship of uh, ethical and sustainable approaches throughout the years that we know in the past were not part of our industry's um, uh, priorities, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not necessarily only truthful about the art of jewelry. Uh, it calls to light the reality in which ethical values in general and sustainability um, were secondary, if mm -hmm. we can say non-existent. But thankfully, we can witness a change that we have an opportunity to, to be part of that big change. So to my fellow designers um, and collectors and editors and to the entire community, I suggest to really look deep inside within and um, try to disconnect from the trendy and the noise and what's today relevant and perhaps not gonna be relevant tomorrow and really challenge yourself with what is your truth and what you're willing to do and what you're willing to wake up to in the middle of the night and feel that this is your calling because you know each of us has has our own destined uh, path. And I do believe uh, this is really what inherently reflect on um, each and every one of us in our businesses and our designs. Thank you. 
Um, and I mentioned earlier there was a kind of confusion um, between some of the terms that we use when we talk about this area. Could you explain the difference between sustainable, ethical and recycled jewellery? Um, and what does sustainability mean to you from a maker's point of view? Yeah. Um, so when speaking of sustainability, um, it's a very general and broad term. And as many times as we hear it in the past five, six years, um, it's still quite fresh and new. Uh, it means many things to many people. But with that said, the term ethical and recycled, in particular for jewelry, for example, um, recycle, and, recycle and ethical are just very specific and small aspect to my um, understanding of practicing a much larger and more complex, conflict, uh, complex concept of what we call sustainability. So maybe the question um, to ask is, how and why we want to be sustainable as an individual, as a business, why do we want to follow specific um, ethics and values and why do we want to support a specific community? Um, why do we really care about it? And I think from that place, um, we can really get uh, not only better answers that look good on a marketing campaign, but we can actually really identify the things that we're good at as a business, we're good at as people and accelerate that. So I can give you a lot of real life examples for each of these categories. And I promise you that each of them, at least as now, at least for now, uh, will fail in the category of sustainability. And the reason is not because there is a lack of good intention. Um, I think a lot of us really do care and we do feel the impact, um, especially today of, of what, what we've done in the past and the things that we disregarded so it's because many businesses are not so clear on their involvement um, in the field and, and, and may only wish to uh, specify shareholders or market trends or consumers. Um, so while in the past, anything that will fall under ca the category of sustainability was considered to be um, expensive to create or not luxurious to buy, wasn't so attractive because of materials. I think today we have way much more knowledge and uh, technological development and awareness. Um, and so the requirement to be sustainable and successful uh, at what we're doing, being more refined and becoming more um, knowledgeable of what we're doing is very much crucial. And I think it's almost unfor becoming unforgiving when uh, we're not considering components like sustainability in, in the way we do businesses. So I guess in a way that would lead me to um, your next question. Yes, because we're talking about business, obviously, and business is tough at the moment for a lot of people with COVID, with the sort of the shuttering of many stores around the world. Um, how can we apply sustainable practices during such harsh financial times? Because, you know, we are also in business. Um, is this the real test? Well, it's interesting you're saying test. I mean, we are all called to look not only at our businesses, but at our life as individuals uh, in a completely different way. And I actually see it as part of evolution rather than a test. Um, like you mentioned, I think in the evolution of how we've been doing things and how we've been evolving as humanity, uh, we have brought this point in time upon ourselves, And so it's part of our journey. Like we say in, um, in, in traditional yoga, it's our karma, right? Um, there's nothing wrong or bad about it, but what we will do with it today, I feel that's an opportunity uh, to create a better results for tomorrow. Um, so supporting the, ne the next generation of jewelry designer, our industry, uh, the press, uh, the communities, the band jewelers, and educating, um, sharing our knowledge and experiences as a community uh, is super crucial to uh, to the success of the industry and her humanity. And even if I'm talking with you right now about the jewelry industry, I feel that this is really, you can strip it down to, you know, every single person that um, is walking on the planet and every single uh, living thing, right? Uh, just like the lotus, you know, there's a nice um, 
um, correlation and story in Buddhism about the lotus who bro that grows only out of the mud. So I believe if you look at it like that, perhaps the mud that we're all in today as humanity, as the planet, will help us to embark into a, a new way of being and become the lotus. Um, one, you know, a life that is better, that we can be proud of um, to live for our children and our grandchildren. Thanks, Alexandra. So I'm going to move on to Livia. Um, Livia, you produced and presented a documentary series called Fashionscapes, um, which Susan's mentioned, about the impact of fashion and luxury on the environment, which is currently available on Amazon Prime. One of the episodes, called The Diamonds of Botswana, sees you delve into diamond mining in Africa. What did you learn about the balance between business and environmental protection? Oh, you're on mute, I think, Livia. Sorry. Great. Here I am. Um, you missed, thank you for having me here. <laughs> um, <laughs> before I, I tell you about my trip in Botswana, I wanted to pick up on something about sustainability because I think there is a misconception. The word sustainability is, means exactly what it says, something that's sustaining time. And it's nothing to do with ethics. So something can last a long time, but be completely unethical. And we are dealing to that, you know, the, I love the title of this conference about, you know, the minefield in the jewelry industry about sustainability, because it is a minefield. Also because we are talking about, and I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge it, one of the most untraceable and unethical industry um, in terms of supply chain, because the raw materials as you know, check, they get mined in one country, sent to another country to be cut and polished and go to very, change so many hands before they arrive at the actual jewelry that makes the jewelry piece that then we buy. So as Susan rightly said, the closest thing to sustainability in the jewelry industry is the power of storytelling. So can we tell the story, the powerful story behind the piece of jewelry that we buy and behind the stones that we have? and the thing that I love about, because for disclosure, I've been, I've been working in supply chains for the last 10 years, equally in mining and fashion. And I traveled the world I've, I've, in so many countries and I've seen so many raw material supply chain, had so many garment workers. And the thing that I started appreciating about the actual jewelry industry is that it's actually an industry that has done so much more in a way that the fashion industry to get better. And that you know, has learned from the lessons of the past and built from there. Um, you know, when you talk about diamonds, the first thing that people think, you, you mentioned diamond and immediately people think blood diamonds. But then what happened between the, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie and today is a completely different story of improving and actually creating blueprints of how diamond mining happens than what happened in the fast fashion industry, for example, which still enslave millions of garment workers around the world, pollutes with that, you know, like cowboys. So it's very important to look at, this is something that we need to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And this is why I went to Botswana, because, you know, the Fashionscape miniseries was, is mini documentaries, it's 12 minutes each. So it's very short. Um, and the idea was to explore different raw material supply chain and different issues. So I did one on the, you know, in Australia about the wool um, supply chain, another one in, in Guatemala about artisans. And then I went to um, Botswana. And when, you, when I arrived in Botswana, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to find. I knew before having worked for many years with Chopard, that, for example, there was a beautiful ethical mine, diamond mine called Lucara, um, which is run by women and uh, produces some of the biggest diamonds in the world. And the entire operation are 100% ethical, but I didn't know much else. And so as I started traveling across the country, visiting the mines, but most importantly, talking with the people who were working in mining, in the mines, I then discovered a completely different reality from Bangladesh, for example, you know, where you go to the factories and the women are even afraid to look at you in the eyes and they, you know, they all live in poverty wages and they're exploited. And instead in Botswana, I met 
women and men, but many, many strong women who are incredibly empowered, so proud to be working in that industry, educated, and from the, you know, the truck driver to the janitor to the, you know, the, the, the managing director of the mine, you know, there is a social ladder, everyone has an opportunity and a possibility and everyone is, you know, the first thing they tell you is, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the mining industry. And I'm so happy. And you have a kind of blueprint of how a business operates in a country where they make, you know, the diamond industry in Botswana has made a, a, a agreement with the um, government, which is a three-way agreement. So there is, is a business relationship between the diamond company, the government and civil society. So a huge majority of the profit also go back to the country of Botswana to create the infrastructure and build the schools and the roads and the hospitals. And so it was, it, you know, it was far from being perfect, but so much more perfect and better than so many of the fashion companies and industry that I visited around the world. I think that's interesting. That three-way balance is, is something we don't really see in many places. Um, in terms of the key issues about what we should be concerned about within the field of sustainability as it is now, um, what, what, how does it work very briefly and how should, you know, what, how, do, how should it work? Are there any obvious issues that we should address straight away? Well, I think it's important for the jewellery industry to start, and it should start from the designers and the brand, the big jewellery brands, they should be proud to be telling those stories. You know, so I saw that today Cartier, for example, just announced a big initiative, you know, Chopard started eight years ago, with, you know, working with us with the journey to sustainable action and being proud of you know, the challenges and the results that they did. You know, in only five years, they changed an entire supply chain in gold into ethical gold. And so the question that needs to be addressed is, why, cannot we, why can't we tell all these stories? What are the issues? So if an issue is um, the cut and polishing that doesn't happen in the, where the diamond, for example, get mined, why can't we do it there? You know, and in Botswana, in fact, they, they solved that and they're doing, you know, they're cutting and polishing the diamonds in the country. Uh, but the majority, I mean, it's almost an unheard story. No one else does that. Um, the gold, for example, is if it's artisanal gold certified fair mind or fair trade from Latin America, when it travels to the bank or why if jewelry buy golden ingots from the banks and no one knows where that gold comes from. So I think there are multi, multi you know, uh, stakeholder agreements that need to be done and partnership that needs to be organized so that you know, the bank too can work with the mining company and the refineries and you know, these are incredibly long and complicated supply chains. Mm -hmm. But little by little, we now have examples of how it can be done. And of course, you mentioned Chopard um, and you work with them for a long time to sort of um, uh, transform their supply chain. Um, their first high jewelry collection using fair mine gold, I believe was uh, called the Queen of Kalahari, uh, which is a big white diamond collection. Um, what surprised you about working you know, on that project and how is sustainability in jewelry different now, would you say, from fashion? I mean, you've mentioned fashion, but you know, has it moved on from, the, from this project? Well, the Queen of Kalahari is not, is actually one of the latest projects. It's only a couple of years old. Um, the, we started in 2013 with um, launching a strategic partnership between Chopard and the Alliance for Responsible Mining in Latin America, mm -hmm. which is an NGO that, you know, was, certifying fair mine gold for um, small scale mining communities uh, in all the South American countries. And so that was the beginning of the gold journey. And then with the diamonds, you know, we, we started looking at not only, and the color gemstone, it's not only about what are the certification available, because for example, with diamonds, you have the RJC, but with color gemstones, there is no certification. And in fact, in the last couple of years, there's been a working table, a, a, of you know, brands and organization to try and see how can we create a 
um, certification for colored gemstones. But it was more about who can be the strategic partners, where to buy the raw materials in order for Chopard to tell those stories. And the Queen of Kalahari is one of that. You know, this the partner was Lucara because you know it was one of the most ethical mine diamond mine in the world, um, and in fact the probably most ethical uh, diamond mine in the world. And Chopard bought this gigantic diamond called the Queen of Kalahari, and then cut it to create this beautiful collection. And I saw. It's interesting because earlier on you asked um, also the question about is the consumer interested in, in sustainable or you know ethical jewelry? Well, through the years I saw it with my eyes because Chopard since the beginning launched a green carpet collection as opposed to their iconic red carpet collection, and I saw that all um, you know the buyers and the um, collectors. If you put on a tray a piece of a, a red a red carpet jewelry and a green carpet jewelry, they always went for the green carpet because they had a story that they could tell. So when you wear your, your necklace or your earrings, you can say it's not only oh yes, it's from Chopard. Is do you know that this diamond comes from Lucara in Botswana and it's incredible? And you know, so you have an added story to tell as part of what you're wearing, which is very important. I think I totally agree with that. I think meaning is the key to the future of jewelry just in general. And that brings me to the Raquel. Hello, Raquel. Um, so gemstones like this are very valuable as a commodity, as we know, both their beauty and store of wealth. Yet given the mining effects to extract them, how important is it that we use sustainable practices in your view? I think that what you mentioned is exactly a key, is talking about sustainable practices because sustainability already per se for mining doesn't exist because we have extracted already probably 75% of our natural resources. And we know that already from our, if we look at Golconda diamonds in India, there is no more diamonds over there. If we look at um, the emeralds from uh, Cleopatra, which make her empire, no more emeralds in Egypt or very tiny in Ethiopia. Um, the, the, the story of gems that has been exhausted, it goes on and on, including even the, and if we go into the metals, we have all the, the golds from California and Colorado that also are exhausted. So starting from there, we have to think, the starting point is that our resources are finite. Mm. Sorry. And there is a limited amount in our earth and all these things, people think we can even go and mine platinum in the moon. There is no platinum in the moon. <laughs> so we have to think that our resources are finite and we already extracted 75% of our resources. So if we think about that, we are left with few alternatives. And one is then one of them, which is the most important, is how we can lower our consumption of natural resources and also the rate of consumption. We think about really straight curve, we are already up here and our limit is here. So reduce that rate of consumption while also reusing and recycling the material that has been extracted already. So I, I think it's, I, and we must do under sustainable or these in reality best standard practices. I think that's a very good point. You know, it's, we can't just consume without any ramifications. Um, and so you work obviously um, at Harvard and you, you are responsible for lots of um, gemstones in, in a very large, very impressive collection. Can you give us some examples of rare and special gems and also gold pieces that you have in your collection and tell us what these jewels um, kind of explain about culture and history from your, from your perspective? Yes, as you said, we have an outstanding collection and for today's talk, I decide I chose one piece that emphasized uh, different meanings. One is really the, the historical and the human aspects that we leave trace. And at the same time, how we can use the same piece to advance knowledge through research. That's an MLA brooch. Maybe come on the side in a minute. Yeah, we have a slide. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, we can go, yes. So, yeah. so this emerald brooch um, was donated to us by a woman that died last year. She was already one, one, 102 years old. 
but she was a survivor of the Holocaust, thanks to pieces like that. She was able to leave Vienna during World War I and World War II and come to the States to um, make a living. And her few leftover pieces of jewelry, she wanted to give it to a museum that would preserve them in perpetuity. And that's, we have few from her. So that's the historical that collections are not only museum collections. I also think like designer and jewelry collections, something is very important because they preserve the historical aspect of our human, human history. Mm. But then at the same time, we were able to use that gem, my colleagues and I, including also working with GIA, with Aaron Parker, on how we can trace uh, gemstones, how we can really understand what's the path and not from a driven uh, market value as provenance. We know some localities are more valuable than others, but really to understand exactly if we know what it comes from and the whole journey by using the geochemical fingerprints that we can read from the gemstone in itself, then we might be able to, to help with sustainable practices. And the same like we talk about gems, diamonds are tricky as, a, as Susan mentioned at the beginning, but we should be thinking about the same with metal, with precious metals, and that's what Livia mentioned about the gold mining. We have also an outstanding gold collection, and we have been using it. If most of them come from the gold rush, and we have been using it for research. And the techniques are not there yet, but we know when there is illegal mining, they they tend to be used a very uh, polluted um, uh, mercury. And that can go in the river, it could go in the environment. So we are looking for techniques that we can trace some of these elements. So in the future, we can tell even if it has been processed, there is something that tells us a little bit about illegal mining. And the reason to do that is then we can track down again and try to put some practices in place. And so we're kind of talking about how we can decrease our consumption and increase our, our kind of knowledge. What in your view can society do to care more about sustainable jewellery in a general capacity? I, you know where I stand from, I have been in academia my entire life and as Susan also mentioned before, education is at the core of uh, knowledge and at the core of what we do. And it can be through museum exhibits, it can be through classes, courses. However, I think also the, the jewellery industry has a great potential to really uh, raise an awareness of sustainable and sustainable practices. And I think that potential has not been fully tapped into it yet. Mm. Yes, I think um, that's that's a good point. Um, from, my, from my perspective, I think sustainability can seem a bit worthy um, in, in some of the ways we talk about it. And I wonder Jewelry sometimes is a bit of a naughty treat for, for, for people who especially self-purchase. Is there a way that we can talk about the concept of sustainability in a more exciting way for the end consumer? Is anyone, that's a sort of general group question if anyone wants to leap in with that one. Well, I, I, if, I mean, for me, it, this is, I mean, sustainability is not worthy at all. And if, mm -hmm. if we go back to what I was saying at the beginning, we shouldn't even use the sustainability in the jewelry industry. It's about ethics and, you know, and the power of a story only adds. Um, true luxury should be being able to tell the story of your, of your piece of jewelry. So it's not about worthiness, it's about, it's exactly the opposite. It's much more glamorous to be ethical than to be unethical. That's great. Anyone else want to? Jump in. Hi, this is Susan. Uh, we had a panel on sustainability at the JCK show um, a couple of years ago, and Dr. Salim Ali um, from the University of Delaware, who is um, the professor of energy and environment, um, was one of the, the participants. And he's one of the few independent researchers that actually has really looked into this um, topic. And it was interesting because he said that while jewelry may be a luxury product that not everybody needs, 
It does sustain a standard of living for millions of people who work in the German jewelry supply chain. And I think that's a really important point that we need to continue to focus on. And so we don't, definitely don't want to demonize luxury. Um, there's a, a large population that enjoys luxury products and jewelry is not a need product, but very much an, an emotional product. And I think even during this time of the pandemic, we're seeing great success at the retail counter because of the sentimentality that jewelry brings. And people want something that is sentimental, that is has reverence to it, that, that has connectivity to it. And I think jewelry is that perfect gift. And I think we're going to have a strong holiday season this holiday season because of that. Sure, we are benefiting from the lack of travel, lack of hotels, dining out, restaurant, all of those things. But there is this incredibly emotional tie to jewelry. And I think that that will continue. And I think that how we tell the story, how we educate consumers will be the driving force for the continued desirability of the product. Mm. Thanks, Susan. Um, I think we've got time for one more question for the group. Um, what do you guys think the most confusing thing about sustain sustainability is from a business perspective? The most confusing thing? Yes. I'm happy to answer that. Sure, go for it, Alex. Well, I think for many years, being sustainable equaled uh, being unprofitable from the standpoint of business uh, operations. Um, from the standpoint of the consumer, if you would say I have a sustainable product, they would think about recycling their garbage and moving you know, uh, their uh, milk box to a different kind of uh, trash can uh, and separating plastic from paper. Um, this is from a public standpoint. And I think today, and I would, I would emphasize it, I think it's really important to emphasize, at least from my perspective and my own personal journey and things that I see around, that sustainability is a way of being, that ethics are a huge part of being sustainable because ethics are the thing, the way that we drive our decision-making in our life. Mm -hmm. And being sustainable, like the UN determines, it's all about what's going to be left in the future for next generation. This is really the umbrella of sustainability. Everything that we do and decide and walk through in the path of sustainability is with the eyes to the future, right? That's the bottom line. But the way we do it and our come from and how, how and why we do it is super important. And I think without without being ethical and with, without knowing why we're doing what we're doing. And this is something that I always communicated with my clients even before I started this journey of sustainability because I believed that as, as a, a salesperson or a designer, if you are not able to see the person who stands in front of you as a human being who wants to be seen and loved and cared for, all the marketing campaigns and all the luxurious ideas um, are going to kind of, you know, go over their head. But the, the, real, the real difference, I think, especially today that is more and more needed and more effective in a way is to get, to get to see people for who they are as humans. And I think once we start calling them consumers, we failed. Good point. Um, and I think that's it for us for the group questions. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm going to hand back to Kelly, who I think has some Q&A hot questions from the public. Uh, Kelly, if you're there, please uh, yes. grill us with, with, with some general questions. Yes, I am here. We have some good questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think what, you know, this question has come up uh, quite a few times. Can we unpack the terms ethical and sustainable a little bit further? Like, what do we mean when we say ethical? And what do we mean when we say sustainable? And how should the industry be using these terms when we're talking about jewelry? I think that might be one for Livia, I suspect. <laughs> well, I, hopefully I answered it at the beginning of my um, question to you, Melanie. But, you know, yeah. again, for me, sustainable is not it's a word that means everything and nothing. And we shouldn't, for me, it always means one thing, which is, does it last in time? It's sustainable. Um, 
So from a business point of view, you have a business, a sustainable business, when the business, even in 10 or 20 years time, can still have a profitable, you know, business model. And you'll never have that if you exploit people and you exploit the planet. So from a business point of view, your business is unsustainable if you don't treat properly the people that work in your business and you don't secure the raw material and make sure that, you know, they, they don't have a huge impact onto the environment. From the point of view of a stone and a piece of jewelry in itself, the word is not sustainable, it's about ethics. And it's about, once again, the stories that you can tell about the, that piece of jewelry, that stone, how traceability and transparency feed into the world ethics. And it's not only about environmental, but it's mostly about uh, social. And so as Susan also reminded, and what I saw in, in, in um, Botswana is that when it's done properly, um, and I saw it even in Latin America, and you know, someone also asked about small scale mining communities with gold, it's true, they supply the majority of gold and no one ever talks about them. But when it's done properly, the, the, the effect, the positive effect on these communities are enormous. Um, so hopefully this answered um, that question. I think it does, because I think what we're seeing is uh, people are associating ethics with social and then sustainable with environmental. And really, that's not, uh, you know, ethical can encompass the environmental practices along with the social practices. So I think that totally answers the question. Uh, we have another question about, uh, especially with, you know, millennials rising up, uh, being this, uh, you know, uh, buying, having all this buying power. Uh, how do you see the future of origin documents uh, to be able to support natural diamond sales, especially for millennials and future generations? I think that's probably for Susan. <laughs> I'm happy to take that one. Um, the reason we, we listen to the consumer and, and the consumer is whom we protect. And sorry, somebody just said, don't use the consumer word. Um, but our goal is to ensure that the consumer has trust in the gem and jewelry industry. And that's why GI exists and has since 1931. And so our focus is always very mission driven. And a number of years ago, we started hearing and seeing this trend towards origin. And it started in many other industries, but um, we are coming up with right now actually a colored stone traceability report. Um, it's in a pilot phase right now. We came up a couple of years ago with the diamond origin report. And it's an answer to, again, the consumer wanting to know where their products come from. And it is a visual, beautiful opportunity for retailers to engage in perhaps a way they never really have before in driving natural diamond sales. Um, they can tell a story and, and you've got Russian stones, you've got stones from Lesotho, you've got stones from Botswana, South Africa. Um, there are so many different places that diamonds are mined today. And each of them has a unique story. And so that story doesn't necessarily resonate the, the particular country with every, every um, purchaser, but there are a great example is Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. They had a love that formed uh, for Botswana and it became very important when Harry gave a ring to um, his bride, um, Meghan, that it fulfilled that part of that journey that they were on together. And I'm sure every day when she looks at her diamond ring, it brings back really great memories of the times they spent in Botswana and their love of, of Botswana. So I think there's so many ways, ways for sales associates. And I was a sales associate um, for a very long time. And it is one of the most rewarding um, ways to, to engage in the gem and jewelry industry. Because again, as I said earlier, it's the end of the supply chain. And that consumer is standing in front of you with a desire. And it's a question of listening to what it is they want more than you telling them. And so by listening, we've learned a lot that origin is important. Now, is it important to absolutely everybody? No, but to the, a lot of the younger generation, this is definitely a trend that we will continue to see. And it's a trend that I think is healthy for the trade because it brings greater transparency, it brings uh, greater authenticity 
And I think all of those are beneficial for the trade to continue to uh, be successful. Great. I, you know, going along um, with the uh, conversation about uh, origin documents, you know, that there's a, uh, a question about how uh, lab-grown diamonds are seen as inherently ethical or more ethical than natural diamonds. So can anybody speak to, you know, uh, kind of unpack that question and clear up any, uh, you know, misconceptions about uh, lab-grown diamonds and natural diamonds and the ethics or uh, the lack of ethics on, on for both? I'm happy to answer that. I can uh, answer that too. Um, so I'll do it quickly, Raquel. <laughs> um, I think I think there's a lot of fear in the jewelry industry from uh, that new coming new kid in town called uh, Lab Grown Diamond. I do believe that there is room for everyone. There is a market for everyone, and there is a, a buyer for every product. It's, very, it's two very different things. Uh, the one thing I think is important to remember that. Lab grown diamonds are not necessarily more sustainable than um, natural diamonds. And I think that this, it's a whole long conversation, but um, I'm sure there's a, a lot of information out there that people can look into to see how those lab grown diamonds are being manufactured, how they affect the environment, carbon, fr carbon footprint, and you know, everything else that goes along into making this beautiful uh, gemstone by men, uh, in opposed to the million years under the ground by nature. Yeah, I think I agree. I, I'm happy, Alexandra, you, you said at the beginning, it's two completely different things. I mean, for me, medical age, because as I said, we've been working in mining for so many years, when the lab-grown diamonds started to come in, with the claim of sustainability, obviously our antenna were like, Zoop! Let's go and see, <laughs> you know, um, because to dig and understand properly the issues and um, and so they are co two completely different things. And but the claim to sustainability is actually nothing to do with lab on diamonds because you know, uh, for example, I remember a couple of years ago coming across a report, an independent report by a company called True Cost that established that the CO2 emission of lab grown diamonds are three times bigger than natural diamonds, three times bigger. And this is because it uses to create a lab, a diamond in a lab, as you can imagine, without having studied many reports, it takes a huge volumes of power and energy that comes also from water, for example. So when then you go and look how much water the lab grown diamond use, and where does that water come from? Guess what? In some cases, it also comes from indigenous land. It's water that comes from land. So actually, the lab grown industry uses mine, mining of water. So it is it's so confusing. And as you said, Alexander, it's two completely different things. A lab grown diamond, if I was the first person who created a lab grown diamond, I would have never called it a lab grown diamond. I would have called it something else because it is something else. And I remember, you know, Carolyn Schoeffel um, from Chopard once comparing the Apple Watch to a watch, you know, built in a, in a, in a workshop of Chopard and takes months and, you know, hours and hours and all the impacts in the communities. And you think well, with the Apple Watch is great, but it's two different things. You're not gonna pass the Apple Watch to your granddaughter or grandson. So it's the same with diamonds. And also, again, what has been said before, lab grounds have no repercussions on communities at all. While diamond mining in this case, or gold mining, any mining, when it's done properly, has hugely impactful, beautiful impact on the community. So. It's two different things, and and it's so it's almost um, it's a, it's, there is a lot of greenwashing. Let's put it that way. Melanie, if I also can, I can add is that the jewelry industry is not the belly button of the world. If you if you think about it, I mean the reason why diamonds are produced in a lab is for, is because we need it for industry. The amount of information that a diamond holds on the defects is much more than a silica chip. 
So the reason why the industry is producing diamonds is because we need it for industry. Like at the beginning when we were producing ruby for laces back in the back in the, even the 20s, the 50s. So it's just the leftover of that huge industrial process of creating diamonds that goes trickle into the jewelry industry and then we use. So it's an industrial process and that's already telling you yeah. that it's industry. I, I would agree with that. I mean, most lab-grown diamonds are used in industry, you know, like the overwhelming majority of them. And uh, one thing I would say is like the Apple Watch for me is a computer. It happens to be worn on the wrist, but it could be worn anywhere. Um, you know, it's very different from, say, a piece of hand-created mechanical art, you know, which was just taken 10 years to create. So it's a very different thing. And um, I'd say, you know, the lab-grown diamonds sort of argument has become quite political. Um, and which is unfortunate because, um, you know, if I were to treat myself to a very nice piece of jewellery, I want it for a lifetime and I want it to mean everything and I want it to sort of chart my emotional evolution in life. And, you know, it, 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 the fact is it, it does connect me to the planet in some way. And there is a, there's a cost for that as we're talking about today. But I think that disassociation with lab going diamonds, something that's just sort of created for in a couple of months in the lab. For me personally, you know, the emotion I want to have, that connection with that jewel is kind of missing slightly, but it, I think it's more of an accessory than a jewel for me, but it's still definitely, there's a place for it because otherwise there wouldn't be a market. But yeah, there is a misconception that it is ethical. It's not really. So I think we can, we've kind of all agreed on that point. <laughs> Great. Okay. So last question, because I know we're coming, we're uh, almost out of time. Is there any indication on when there will be um, heavier regulations that are coming toward the industry that will actually formalize these processes and uh, push compliance in, um, you know, through governmental regulation? I, I can answer something that uh, is coming actually from uh, the standpoint of manufacturing. Um, and for, I mean, most of you know, a lot of the jewelry businesses, maybe in recent years, it started to change, but they're mostly family owned. And the way those businesses are working, their structure, their financial um, operation, uh, the level of trust and how people work with each other has been so different than, you know, for example, if you look at a corporation that manages uh, a business, right? And so I think this, it's really important to understand that the jewelry industry predominantly works very differently. I don't think that the change will come from government issuing um, restrictions. Um, I think it, it's, it's gonna be a greenwash, like Olivia said. Uh, I do believe that bringing those um, people who have created and established the industry into the story and really showing them what are the benefits of becoming uh, more involved in that um, way of doing business is way more effective than coming from the top and saying you have to do this or that. I mean, if you look at the, some organization, I don't, I don't want to mention specific names, but there are a lot of really good um, actions that are being done today and offered to the industry. And I must tell you that I have learned again and again that it's nice on the paper, you get a certificate, you do a lot of things along the way to get those certificates. But if you go deep in and you look exactly how things are working, it's not the promise that you're thinking um, this is what it needs to be. So again, I think the jewelry industry is very different in, in how it's constructed and the way to create a difference is to bring in everybody uh, as a community as jewelers as salespeople, as manufacturers gem gem dealers and really involving them involving them and having them benefit from that change i'd agree with alex there i think i think the change will come from the art i think a lot of what we're talking about um you know, desire for jewellery at all comes from brilliant design, from, from artistic creation. And I'd love to see more high level designers like Chopard, um, like Alexandra, other people um, of that quality actually, you know, just go for sustainable practices. And I think that's a battle, you know, we're here to sort of maybe, you know, 
fight and, and try and get more people interested at a very high level of design so that we can get that desire kind of pumping through the industry for, for, for pieces which are sustainable and also beautiful. That's what we did with Vogue Italia. If you remember, um, Melanie, for the past four years, unfortunately, COVID didn't allow us to do it this year again. But the annual Vogue Italia um, event that happened in New York every year for the past four years became a sustainable fine jewelry and was actually the first of its kind in the world in the fine jewelry industry. And designers were allowed to come in even, the, even if they didn't have a practice of sustainable um, materials or support of some kind uh, of what they believe in, um, we created a space for them to start that, right? So they become involved. So it started with two pieces and the next year, everybody came back and created a whole capsule collection. And then they started changing their packaging and their business. So this is where, this is where the change come from. Mm. Okay, great. So we're, we're just about out of time. This has been a fantastic discussion and I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us uh, for our panelists and for the people who have attended. Uh, we have some additional reading. I know there's always, um, you know, a desire to learn more and more about the details of these. So uh, we have Melanie's book Coveted that uh, just came out yesterday. Uh, we also have a few more suggestions here. Bejewel, the world of ethical jewelry sustainable jewelry principles and processes for creating an ethical brand and eco jewelry handbook a practical guide for a healthy safe and sustainable uh, and so we will include uh, this list as well in our email that we send out with a list of the uh, or, or the link to this session so that you can watch it again if you'd like uh, we also, uh, you know, we got through a good amount of questions, but if you have any more questions, please reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. And thank you all again for joining us and come again to our knowledge session next week, where we'll be joined by Dr. Aaron Palkey, Robert Weldon, and Wim Vertrees. And they're going to give us a behind the scenes look to, uh, at some of their field gemology expeditions. So we'll see you all again next week. And thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. <laughs>